Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the second presentation in our 65th season. My name is Laura Frank and I'm the Advancement Director of the Chamber Chorus and I'm very excited to be here with Philip Barnes, our Artistic Director. And I have to say it's particularly exciting to be talking about the contributions of women composers um, at a time when the American people have just elected our first female vice president. So it seems particularly fitting to have this conversation today. So Philip, can you um, talk to us about the first piece and introduce what has now become such a central piece of the Chamber Chorus mission? Sure. Well, thank you all again for being here, uh, either virtually or in the room with us. That piece you heard, uh, I think, in some ways has become prophetic. It was one of the first pieces that we had written for us, and it's by a female composer, and it's called Foundation. It's one of five hymns from a 19th century collection of hymns known as the Sacred Harp that was arranged for us by our accompanist at the time, our rehearsal accompanist, somebody who was uh, invaluable to me for her couple of decades that she worked with us in the chamber chorus and still very much a good friend of me and of the choir, and that was Martha Schaefer. I knew as soon as Martha presented the five hymns to me that they were winners. I, you could just tell. Um, and so I wasn't surprised uh, after that that they were snapped up by Oxford University Press, which means that they've been performed all over the place, not just by the chamber chorus. And Martha indeed went on and arranged several other pieces or wrote several original pieces for us in the time that she was associated with the choir. And they are wonderful, wonderful compositions. I hope we'll hear at least one more of those in a future presentation. Now, Martha was the accompanist, the rehearsal accompanist for many years. Um, but before her time, and indeed before my time, there was a lady who was an accompanist for a while and also a soloist with the chamber chorus. And that person was Audrey Cooper Hammond. Now, I didn't know Audrey. Some of the former um, members of the choir knew her. So they introduced her to me, as it were, the idea of Audrey Cooper Hammond by saying, there's this lady we know, and she'd like to send you a piece of music to see whether you think it would be right for the choir. Now, there's a sort of general rule among many choir directors out there. It's a pretty rude rule, but here we go. And the rule is, you never get for free something that you would pay for, you know? So I said to these friends, sure, Mrs. Hammond can send me this piece of music. What was I going to say? No. But I, I knew it would be not very good and not, not very interesting. So this piece of music arrived, and I was completely wrong. It's one of the many times I've been wrong with this choir. Um, and it was a, a remarkable, remarkably powerful, strong setting of a strong verse by Walt Whitman. It's called The Ship Starting. And it hadn't just been written by Audrey Cooper Hammond. It had been written, who was by then, by the way, at the end of her playing career. But it, it was written at the beginning of her career, in, the in her 20s. And she had written this piece, uh, I think she was on a Fulbright to Paris or something like that. And so she'd written this piece and all looked as if she was going to have a, a career as a performer and maybe as a composer. And indeed, she did continue her playing career, though not quite at the level that she might have done. But she met her husband, of course, Bill Hammond, and they married and had a family. And as has happened so often in the case of women composers, uh, I'm afraid composition then took a back seat. So this was a piece that Audrey had written in very different times, very different circumstances, it's quite a difficult piece, so I imagine she thought that she had written it for herself and that nobody would actually ever get to perform it. So we were thrilled to, to have the opportunity to, to give a public performance of this piece. And in fact, we performed it several times and we recorded it on one of our commercial CDs. 
Um, it's a really strong work. Uh, Walt Whitman, of course, great American poet, has inspired so many composers. I often wonder why. I think it's because of the images. I think the, 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 the images of the poetry sort of fire the imagination. And you can hear in this arrangement of the ship starting the idea of the undulating waves, the, the, the massive ocean, and the idea of just the ship with its pennants flying, just cutting through the deep. So, without further ado, a piece that I didn't have to pay for, but was worth a lot. This is The Ship Starting by Audrey Cooper Hammond. So Philip, among the ranks of chamber chorus singers, we also have many fine musicians and composers. Um, in more recent years, we have, we've heard some compositions from members, and um, I was interested to learn about this piece, which was before my time, this next piece, which was written by a singer in the chamber chorus, correct? Correct, yes. Um actually before my time as well, although I did know this person. I sang with her when I first came to St. Louis. Her name's Carolee Coombe Stacy, and she was a very important member of the chamber chorus in the first decades of the choir. She particularly was associated with Ronald Arnatt and sang for him on many different occasions, many different programs. By the time I got here in 88, 
she was a singer in lots of local ensembles and I sang with her. And I didn't really put two and two together and realize that she had been so influential in the early years of the chamber chorus. And I certainly didn't realize how good a composer she was. She was a very interesting person. Some of you listening to this may remember Carolee uh, as somebody who was incredibly talented, but very diffident and uh, not easy to, to get to know, particularly because I think she abhorred tooting her own horn, as it were. She was very shy in that sense. Well, uh, some, at some point, um, I got this, this letter from her saying, would you mind looking at two or three pieces of mine? And I, I said, absolutely, I would. Again, it's like, you know, if somebody's going to offer something to you for free, would you have paid for it in the first place? Here's another example. So she sent me a couple of pieces, and one of them was called God Be In My Head, very familiar text. And that's a very beautiful little introit. And again, that's on one of our commercial recordings. Very beautiful piece. But another work, a little more complicated than that, uh, was a Latin motet, Alma Redemptoris Mater, the kind mother of the Redeemer. And this is, a, I think, a very beautiful, expressive piece, lyrical piece. Um, and so we had the opportunity to give a performance of this work. I think the first time we did it was at the St. Louis Priory, which is one of our favorite acoustics and settings, and they're incredibly welcoming to us there when we go. So I thought we'd hear now this very beautiful setting of Alma Redemptoris Mater. And so the music is by Carolee Coombe Stacy.
So that was Carolee Coombs Stacy's arrangement of the words Alma Redemptoris Mater. Now, that's a familiar Marian hymn. So needless to say, there have been many settings of those same words by composers for centuries. And so it's often interesting, sometimes fun, to listen and compare different interpretations of the same words. And often you find yourself making like a judgment call, which you like better, you know, which you think is, is a stronger setting of those words. Uh, but sometimes a piece, an arrangement can be so different from one you're familiar with that you, you no longer have to play the comparison game. It's just completely different. And you think of it in, in its own strengths. So I was really very struck by uh, a modern arrangement of those words. And by modern, I mean, Carol Lee is not ancient, but this is a very different take by a composer very much still with us. She's, I think, about 40 years of age at the time of this program. And her name is Dobrinka Tabakova, and she grew up in early years, anyway, in Bulgaria. And then her parents moved to London, and she moved with them, obviously, and she ended up studying at King's College London, which actually eons ago is where I studied. So um, I, I knew about the name. I also knew that in some programs in England, they had had uh, concerts of music by women composers, and one of those composers was our own Sasha Johnson Manning, but another was Dobrinka Tabakova. And so you often hear about the line, you are the company you keep. So I thought, well, Dobrinka Tabakova is in good company. And so I listened to her music, and every single piece of music I've heard by Dobrinka has really made an impact upon me. She is not prolific. She doesn't write an enormous amount of music. But I do recommend her creativity and her originality to you. She's written vocal music, piano music, string orchestra music, several different genres, and each one of them has something new and engaging to say. So I asked her whether she would consider writing for the chamber chorus. Now, unfortunately, I got there, you know, like five minutes too late, as opposed to five minutes early, because she'd already, the word was already out, and she was receiving commissions from all over Europe. So it took a very long time to persuade her, but finally she agreed to write a major piece for us, another piece in Latin, a Missa Brevis, and then, wouldn't you know it, COVID struck. So this is something for us all to look forward to. She's very much uh, looking forward to the, uh, the writing of this mass setting for the chamber chorus. She has listened to our recordings. I think she's um, certainly educated herself in that distinctive, rich sound that this choir makes. And one of the ways I think that we, we persuaded her that we would do our best to uh, represent her music at its finest is a performance of the piece I just mentioned, Alma Redemptoris Mater. And we performed that at St. Stanislaus Kotska Church uh, in an all Russian program. And she's not Russian, but I thought it was an interesting juxtaposition. And we performed another piece of hers, a Traperion. So we're just beginning to get to know this uh, woman composer, and I trust that, that she will become something of a, a permanent uh, feature in our programming in the years to come. Now, a lot of you listening and, and in the room today have seen some of the composers we have been lucky to bring in from all over the world and you've had an opportunity to hear their music and see them in person as they've come to St. Louis. That hasn't happened with the Brinker yet. So instead, I asked if she would conduct a little interview with me by Zoom, so you can get a foretaste of when we actually bring her here in the flesh, and we can thank her in person for her very beautiful music. So without further ado, let's listen to a little interview I conducted with Debrinka a few weeks ago. And then after that, we will hear the piece Alma Redemptoris Mater by Debrinka Tabakova. Well, hello, Debrinka. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, chat about your music 
on this uh, presentation by the Chamber Chorus about women composers. It's a great pleasure to see you. And of course, we are all eagerly looking forward to that day in the future when we can perform the world premiere of the piece that you're going to write for us. But enough about that for a minute. Let's talk about the piece that we're hearing on this program, your fantastic, if I may say so, setting of Alma Redemptoris Mater. One of the things that really caught me with this piece when I first heard it was that it was like no other setting of those words. And I have sung so many versions of those words in my long life. And of course, we have our own version of that from Carolee Coombe Stacy, who was a former member of the choir. Your setting has a completely different atmosphere, much more spiritual, it seems to me. Can you tell us a little about how that piece came about? Hello, Philip. It's a great pleasure to be with you, albeit virtually, hopefully in real life soon. Um, uh, yes, and uh, I've heard this recording of the St. Louis uh, Chamber Chorus, and it's fabulous. It's a, it's a beautiful performance. And um, it, it was a, the piece was originally uh, written and commissioned by Merton College, uh, the chapel choir of Merton College in Oxford, um, for their 750th anniversary, I think. They, they commissioned a group of, uh, of female composers to write Marian antiphons, of which the Alma Redemptoris Mater is one. And my approach to every piece is that I do research before I uh, start working with, with the material itself. And usually when that is choral music or has text, uh, that's um, attached to the to the uh, work. It, it involves really getting to as far deep into the world of uh, into the source of how that concept or that piece or that that poem came about. So in this in in the case of the Alma Redemptoris Mater, it took me right back to the original Gregorian chant of um, of of the work and. It felt like I, I couldn't not have that original woven into the work in some form. So really that became the backbone or the skeleton of the work, the, the original Gregorian chant. And you hear it gently being suggested and, and, and being introduced into these um, triadic antiphonal chords that, that are placed in the choir from one side or from another, just sort of in a slightly bell-like um, way, setting the scene for the Gregorian chant to then be introduced for the first time in the altos, and then it gets passed through the different lines, slowly accumulating and um, building in, in terms of um, layering um, different versions of it in a major and in a minor uh, tonality. So having that bitonality, creating a little bit of friction in the same way as having the old material treated in a new way. So always trying to see where that sort of friction of the old and the new, um, what, what can come out of that. So that's at the heart of the piece. Tell me, when you say you go back to the Gregorian chant, do you as a composer consciously avoid listening to other people's arrangement of those words, not the Gregorian chant, of course, but other composers' versions of it, or do you seek them out? I mean, how do you, not just with Alma Redemptoris Mater, but with other settings of words, familiar words, what's your approach? Um, First of all, I like to go back to the source and then, depending on the context of the work, of course, I would look at other, um, at other settings. For example, um, I wrote a cantata for Shakespeare's um, 400th anniversary and I was very conscious that I wouldn't even touch the sonnets um, because I think the few sonnets that lend themselves to being set to music have already been so amazingly um, uh, put to music by Britain that I don't think that I, I would like to attempt that even. <laughs> so, yeah. So you do listen to some, I mean, presumably the, the piece you're going to write for us, we've agreed on as a Missa Brevis, 
I mean, it's obvious you must have heard plenty of Mr. Brevises in your life or Miss I Breves in your life. So uh, you can't avoid that. But with a text like Alma Redemptoris Mater, maybe you were able to consciously say, well, I don't think I want to hear Palestrina's version of that until I've done my own. I mean, I don't know. Is, is, or are you, you just welcoming all and any settings before you put pen to paper? Uh, I, I was aware of a few because it was part of my um, undergraduate studies. So I, I, th there was <laughs> there was a study of choral music, and there were a few Alma um, Redemptoris smart matter um, settings which I had heard then. But I didn't actually revisit them. I, I stayed with the as close to the early version as possible, or at least while or close to composition. I'd rather not be aware of other people's works because right. if they're too great, then why, why add another piece? <laughs> and if you're aware of how great they are, why add another piece? So there's a, there's a sense of self-preservation, creative self-preservation as well. Well, let's talk a little about that uh, and how you're going to approach the piece you're going to write for us, the Missa Brevis. Um, Obviously, as I say, you'll have heard other versions of a Mr. Brevis. What is it that will, will color or affect the way you write a piece for this particular choir? I've got two sets of, of thoughts about this. I've got one set of composers who tell me that they're going to write the piece they're going to write and we could sound like a group of foghorns and they wouldn't care. They are going to write their piece. And then there are other people who are, say that they are deeply affected and it, uh, by the, the sound of the St. Louis Chamber Chorus. So I don't think there's a right answer there, I think, or a wrong answer, I should say. So what's your approach going to be uh, when you write for any particular choir rather than just for choirs in general? It's interesting that it's, it's a combination of writing for the choir and for the, if it's known, the space that the music will exist in. So that always colours the way that I approach a new composition. So I've worked with cathedral choirs quite a lot, so I'm, I'm aware of what the acoustics of those buildings allow you to do. So if you do very intricate, fast um, writing, then it usually gets lost in a large space. So um, I think the fact that um, first, actually one of the first things that, that I remember, uh, it, it was a recording that you sent me and what's very striking for uh, your choir, for the St. Louis Chamber Chorus is um, the, the breadth of the, of the repertoire that you cover and uh, v many choirs I think are quite good at Renaissance and maybe some contemporary music but it's, it's the romantic repertoire that I was quite interested to see that, that features very heavily in, in your programming and there was some wonderful Schumann on one of the recordings and um, there's a kind of a richness that often isn't necessarily part of the standard repertoire of a cathedral choir and I think that's one of the one of the sonic colors that are at the back of my mind when I'll be writing a piece for for your choir. Well we can can't wait but we're going to have to but so thank you so much for that explanation of how you're going to approach this commission for the chamber chorus and thank you again for the wonderful music behind Alma Redemptoris Mater, which we so enjoyed. And I promise you, we will be singing again. Uh, we, we love your music. And I think it's a, a wonderful new voice, if I may say, in choral music. So it's so exciting to be able to work with you on that. So all the best. Thank you so much. And I hope that we'll be able to welcome you in person to St. Louis in due course. Thank you for inviting me. I look forward to it.
So there's a common theme for all working women and women composers are the, the same, um, whether we're talking about more modern composers or women um, further back in time. Um, talk to us about Clara Schumann. It seemed the obstacles for her were possibly greater uh, than what composers are facing now. Yes, they were. I mentioned before about Audrey Cooper Hammond having to balance the idea of family life and being a full-time composer. And that is, unfortunately, a theme that runs through this presentation. Clara Schumann is a very good example of this. She was, along with Franz Liszt, she was reckoned to be the greatest pianist in Europe in her day. Um, she was trained, of course, by her father at one point, early, and uh, that man, Herr, Herr Wieck, uh, took in another student called Robert Schumann, and Robert Schumann fell in love with the teenage daughter of his teacher, and it all was incredibly controversial, and uh, Wieck's father did not take kindly to this. Um, so, in fact, I think he tried to oppose the wedding all the day to the wedding, the marriage to the wedding day. But Robert and Clara did get married, and Clara was able to write a certain amount of music as well as play. And, but once the family arrived, and they had a large family, um, she gave up composing. And it was not only just the necessities of helping raise a large family, but it was also not considered uh, socially acceptable for a woman to be a composer, to be writing music as well as being a full-time wife and mother. And indeed, playing in public, uh, just as a pianist, was not necessarily uh, smiled upon. So it was really only after Robert's untimely death that Clara Schumann sort of emerged from the shadows and took up professional uh, piano playing again and was known again throughout Europe for the, the beauty of her playing not to mention the beauty of her face, her person. She was meant to be an extremely beautiful person, inwardly and outwardly. We shouldn't be surprised, therefore, that one of Robert Schumann's great students fell desperately in love with Robert's widow, and that, of course, was Johannes Brahms. But that was a relationship that was never consummated. It was a platonic love affair in many respects. And... Um, when we, hear Rob, uh, when we hear Clara Schumann's music, which is clearly in the same mold as Robert Schumann, we're talking the height of the Romantic movement here, the very type of rich harmonies that Dabrinka Tabakova referenced, and indeed I referenced in our first presentation this season. This is a type of harmony and a type of choral writing that the St. Louis Chamber Chorus really takes to. It, it seems to be right for the blend of voices that we've been able to recruit. When you listen to Clara Schumann's writing, you, you do wonder what we missed. You know, if only she'd had more time to write more herself. Well, make up your own mind. We're going to listen now to one of three settings, three poems of Emmanuel Geibel that talk about life, different aspects of life in Venice. And we're going to hear a song of the gondoliers by Clara Schumann. And again, you can sort of hear, I hope, some of the sort of the romanticism in it, as well as the sort of ebbing and flowing of the waters around Venice itself. So, Clara Schumann, gondoliera.
So rich romantic repertoire there from Clara Schumann. We heard in another presentation, Robert Schumann, that you can hear the same sort of harmonic palette being used there, I think. Music that really suits the St. Louis Chamber Chorus very well. Well, we'll move on now to another composer with Missouri associations and much more recent than Clara Schumann. Um, this wonderful composer is actually still alive, still with us. She has spent a lot of her professional career on the West Coast. She did grow up in Kansas City, Missouri, but um, is now really associated with the University of California at Santa Barbara, where one of her great contributions was the establishment of an electronic music studio. You would never guess that, I think, if you listen to this next piece, because it's nothing to do with sort of experimental electronic sounds. This is a much more uh, conservative and traditional approach, but extremely elegant. Her name is Emma Lou Diemer, and a lot of musicians in churches and schools will be familiar with that name because she has written an immense amount of music for school groups and also for churches, because in addition to being an academic, she's also a church musician and has been all her career. So a lot of the music that she has written is, um, I don't want to be rude about this, it's on a simple level, it's very well crafted, but it doesn't make huge demands of its performers because it's what used to be called serviceable music. It had to work. You couldn't uh, expect something from the performers that they weren't able to give. So it's really interesting to listen to a piece of music that shows her in a different light. This is the sort of more expansive music that she has the, the ability to write given the right circumstances. This piece calls for two grand pianos, percussion, and two choirs. And it's a, a setting of the Arnus Dei, which is the last movement of the mass. And we performed this piece as a collaboration, not just a collaboration with pianists, because well, as you know, we're normally unaccompanied, but also with some dancers from Washington University. So every so often, if you listen really carefully, particularly towards the end, you might hear the nimble feet of some dancers just coming down after a pirouette. And they did a wonderful job, um, really, of trying to give a sort of a, a, a visual, if you will, to her music. So it was an entirely original dance that was created for her music. Her music wasn't intended to accompany modern dance, but it was a very happy collaboration. And so I hope now, as you hear the music and you, hear, you see the images, which are not of the dancers, you'll see how this very poised music, and very, it's got a sort of very steady and measured pace to it. You'll be able to understand, really, why it makes such a wonderful accompaniment or complement to a different art form, in this case, images. So here's the Agnus Day by Emma Lou Diemer.
So, Philip, you mentioned that that recording was from a season of collaborations, or 62nd season, I believe. Yeah. That allowed the chamber chorus to collaborate with other local artists in St. Louis. Um, tell us about this next piece. The composer, for many followers of the chamber chorus, we've become very familiar with her, but we're not as familiar with this recording and this collaboration. Can you tell us about it? Certainly. This is uh, Sasha Johnson Manning, who was our first composer in residence and who has continued to write for us on many occasions ever since. Great favorite of the choir and of our audiences. Sasha lives in the northwest of England, in Man near Manchester, and we, we grew up in the same church choir together. And uh, for the occasion of a joint concert between the chamber chorus and a visiting English cathedral choir from Norwich, we asked Sasha to write a piece that the two choirs could perform together, and then ideally they could go on and perform it on, on their own. So it would work for Norwich and it would work for us separately. And so she chose words by a New Zealand poet. Actually, I think if I remember rightly, I may have suggested those words. And there's a reason why this poet, James Baxter, came to mind. And it's because he was set to music by another New Zealand composer who was the successor to Sasha Johnson Manning as our composer in residence, and that was Claire McLean. And we're going to hear some Claire McLean shortly. So Claire McLean had set Baxter. I, I learned of this amazing poet, really remarkable poet, and I suggested to Sasha that it would make a very beautiful text for a piece to be written for the chamber chorus and for Norwich Cathedral Choir. And the focus of the program, which we gave at St. Michael and St. George Church in Clayton, was going to be an examination and a celebration of the British composer Gerald Raphael Finzi, and a, a great favorite of mine. And I know a lot of singers know Finzi for his beautiful song cycles. Uh, so he's beloved of singers, really, on both sides of the Atlantic. So we had this program of music written by Finzi or by a couple of his teachers. And then finally, this piece by Sasha that would be written in his memory. And that would explain the title, which is Song In Memoriam GRF, which is Gerald Raphael Finzi. So music celebrating, commemorating Gerald Finzi by Sasha Johnson Manning.
Music by Sasha Johnson Manning. Song in memoriam GRF, Gerald Finzi. Well, Sasha was followed by Claire McLean as the second composer in residence. Claire McLean was born in 1958 in New Zealand, but has spent her adult life studying and now teaching in Sydney, Australia. And she writes music, I would suggest, in a very different way, which as a choral director is endlessly fascinating to me, much in the same way that I find Dobrinka Tabakova's view or vision of Alma Redemptoris Mater that's so different from Carolee Coombe-Stacey's. I just find that endlessly fascinating, and I think that both of them have something to say, something to contribute to us. So I find the, the, the thinking, if I understand it, of Claire McLean and her compositional technique, which is so different from Sasha's, to be endlessly stimulating and rewarding. Now, I haven't cleared this with Claire, so she may completely disagree with me. Uh, but as an onlooker, as it were, as a recipient of the music, she seems to me to be somebody, and I'm going to use an analogy here, again, I hope she's not too offended by this, but she seems to me to be somebody who builds up a composition the way a bird constructs a nest. We've, this year, had several house martins in our uh, porch building nests, and it's been really fascinating to, to watch the progress of these nests this one strand at a time. And the strands mean nothing on their own. They have no form or any purpose. But this extraordinary way these little birds weave these things together, and they create this nest that holds together and is, as they say, greater than the sum of its parts. To me, that is how Claire McLean approaches composition. She takes all of these ideas, whether they be melodic or, or rhythmic, and she entwines them, twists them together to create a whole, to create a piece of music. And the, the, her compositions are really not like anybody else's, again, because of this. So that's the first thing that really appealed to me about her vision. It was, it was a new approach to me of writing music, and it really it, it held my attention. We were going to put on a performance of music inspired by ancient poets. And the particular poets we were looking at were Catullus from the Roman world and Sappho from the Greek world. A lot of Catullus's poetry was heavily influenced by Sappho. So, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a setting of Sappho? And then, of course, I must have had a little too much Scottish liquid that night, I don't know. But I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had it in, in ancient Greek? And then I thought, you know, let's have it, it has to be by a woman. Sappho is a female poet. So then I thought, who is crazy enough to take on a commission setting in ancient Greek this poem, and all the, nearly all the poems of Sappho that we have are incomplete, they're fragmentary. So it's a pretty tall order to ask someone to put this to music. So the obvious person who's up for any intellectual challenge was Claire McLean. And this is now in the days before you know, the internet and all the, the easy ways to communicate with people. So my colleague at school, Avery Springer, made a recording on cassette of her reading carefully Sappho's poem and showing where all the natural stresses should be and the pronunciation should be. And we sent that across the world uh, by post and Claire got it in Sydney and she listened to it. And bit by bit, the strands of the nest came together and she created this really remarkable piece, which with this Greek title is Oaths Anthos Kortu. Now, what does the poem mean? Well, as I said, it's fragmentary, but the idea behind this poem is that the person who's sitting opposite you seems to me to be like a god, because the implication is, I'm still in love with you, but you've moved on. So I'm on the outside looking in, 
and I'm seeing this new lover, this new admirer or suitor. And that's a lot of uh, the background, really, to Sappho's poetry, because she was believed to be a tutor to young, marriageable, aristocratic girls. And once she had trained them to be a good spouse, she had to let them go and go to their, their, their husbands. And she formed deep attachments to her students, her pupils, and it was with a very heavy heart that she would let them go. She loved her students. So this poem is a poem of longing, and it's also a poem with lots of interweaving lines. And what I thought would be so interesting is instead of just hearing it and having some beautiful images to see it, this time I thought it would be fun if we actually had some of the extracts of the actual score. So you can sort of see all these different lines happening at the same time. This does not look like a conventional piece of choral music with block chords going one after the other. Now, the poem by Sappho ends prematurely. I mean, it's, it's, it breaks off. The manuscript breaks off. So we're left right at the end of the poem with just we're hanging, if you will. And so what's so clever about this and effective about this is that Claire does exactly the same thing with her music. So the music will be with you, you will hear it, you will hear bit by bit, you will see the strands come together, then you will see the strands uh, come apart, you'll be left with one strand, and then it's gone. Nothing left. So, os anthos cortu, he seems to be like a god who sits opposite you. So the music is by Claire McLean. And remember, this is, of course, not religious music. We perform a lot of religious music. You've heard religious music in this presentation. But we also perform secular music, music of the world. And this is definitely not a sacred piece, but it's a very reflective piece on the human condition. Music by Claire McLean.
one of the reasons the chamber chorus gives voice to these pieces um, is that sadly their works really are underrepresented um, around the country and around the world. Yeah. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about Rebecca Clark. As I understand it, she did not continue with composition. Is that correct? Well, it got uh, shorter and shorter, fewer pieces coming okay. out all the time. Yeah, Rebecca Clark did not write for the chamber chorus. Um, she's, you know, a lot of the music you're hearing in this presentation was written for us, but Rebecca Clark, like uh, Clara Schumann, <clears throat> more of a historic figure, but her tale is similarly tragic in many respects. Uh, Clara Schumann's father strongly disapproved of her marriage to Robert and cut her off, really. Well, guess what happened to Rebecca Clark? Rebecca Clark got into the Royal College of Music in London and started to study with the irascible teacher Charles Villa Stanford. And I think I'm right in saying she was his first female student and he was no trailblazer for women's rights. Um, <clears throat> she showed enormous promise, and one of the young uh, graduates and then part-time teachers at the college, Rafe Vaughan Williams, recognized this as well. I and mean, it was clear that she was incredibly gifted as a composer and as a string player, particularly on the viola. But her father, when he found out that not only was she wasting her time being a viola player, but also was writing music. That was the last straw. So he cut her off without a penny. So she really had to sort of give up being the idea of a full-time composer in the early 20s, and instead supported herself by playing the viola. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that's a, a tie-in for us is that we're a choir that was founded by an, an Englishman, and of course I'm from England as well, and yet here we are in the middle of America. And Rebecca Clark started off her life in, in the UK, was educated in London, but getting nowhere really in the musical world there, she came to America and she spent the last, gosh, I don't know, four decades or so of her life living on the East Coast, making her living as a string player, a very highly respected string player. But there were a large number of people who knew her as a performer who had very little idea uh, of the composing that she had done. Even though she'd won some prizes very early on, by the time they got to know her, that was all sort of ancient history and nobody really bothered too much. So there is some wonderful chamber music by Rebecca Clark, but what happened when she died is that the family went through her papers um, and discovered uh, lots of manuscripts of choral pieces, a lot of that she'd written in the early days in London, settings of people like Thomas Campion and William Shakespeare, and the chamber chorus has performed those pieces and will continue to do so. But there's a late work, <clears throat> or li late in terms of how long she, she, start she composed before she just gave up completely. This is a work from the early 1940s, and it's a setting of Shelley, and the, way, the reason I chose this piece is, of course, um, you just heard a piece in Greek. Shelley wrote this great poem called Hellas, which is the Greek for Greece. And we haven't so far heard just the women of the chamber chorus singing. We've heard women composers. So this piece by Rebecca Clark brings it all together. So you're going to hear now a chorus from Shelley's Hellas, performed by the women of the chamber chorus, and they'll be conducted by my colleague, Andy Jensen.
Music by Rebecca Clark. Chorus from Shelley's poem, Hellas. <clears throat> Sticking with the idea again of Greece, somewhat, uh, we come now to a remarkably uh, evocative piece by our fourth composer in residence. This is Melissa Dunphy, who was uh, born and brought up in Australia, in Brisbane, to, if I remember rightly, a Greek father and a Chinese mother, but fell in love with a man from Philadelphia, and so now lives in America. Uh, and from that sort of cosmopolitan background, I was able to sort of persuade her to take on a remarkable con a commission that would mean something to her emotionally as well as to me. Because two years ago, I was able to uh, go and pay my respects to a relative, a deceased relative, in a far-flung part of the world. I, to my knowledge, I'm only the second person in my family to have made this journey. And this was to the grave of my great-uncle, who I never knew, my great-uncle Douglas Gray. Douglas Gray was a private in the British Army. In 1915, he was part of the invading forces at Gallipoli, part of the campaign in the First World War to distract the Turks from sending in too much assistance to the Germans. Turks, the Ottoman Empire had come in on the side of Germany in that war. So the Allied forces decided to uh, distract the Turks and to invade Turkey and in fact to strike at the heart of the o Ottoman Empire which was Constantinople, Istanbul. So they decided to invade at the Gallipoli Peninsula and make their way up the peninsula, up the Dardanelles to the Sea of Marmara and then to Istanbul itself. But for those of you who are familiar with this campaign, you will know that it ended in ignominy and it was complete and utter disaster for the Allies. They, they barely made it through a few miles before they were repulsed by the Turks. And it was a massive disaster in terms of human life because an enormous number of Allied soldiers were killed and injured in that campaign. Um, I knew that the Australians and the New Zealanders were there, and I knew that the British were there. I must say, I didn't know that about all the Canadians and certainly the French, vast numbers. And lest we forget, on the other side, there were even more casualties on the Turkish side, men who, of course, were defending their homeland. So if you visit Gallipoli today, it is a very somber sort of reminder of the... Of the um, folly and the, the scandal of war. Um, it's a study in contrasts because it's very tranquil. It's very, there's no cities or anything like that. It's very peaceful. And as you wander through a, a, a vineyard, it's almost impossible to, to picture the, the um, trenches and the, the warfare that went on there for month after month after month in awful conditions of weather. Uh, my uncle, oh, my uncle, my great uncle, um, Douglas, was killed at the third battle of the Critia Vineyard. Um, that was this, as far as the Allied troops made it. All around that area, you can see still traces of the campaign. Farmers still dig up bullets and shell casings and buttons from uniforms, you know, 100 plus years later. If you wander along the beaches, as I did, you can still see the rotting hulks of landing craft or an anchor here and there. It's such an extraordinary sort of contradiction, really, that the beauty of the surroundings with this carnage that lies beneath the surface. So I asked Melissa whether she would take on this commission to commemorate uh, the fallen dead at Gallipoli because I knew that for Australians and New Zealanders, Gallipoli was a defining moment in their national identity. It was the first time in which the Australians and the New Zealanders put forward armies under their own name. They were still fighting in the empire, but they were the Australian army, the New Zealand army. And of course, as a lot of you again will remember, it was um, 
they were really sacrificed in many ways on the altar of, of poor planning and generalship in that they uh, landed at the wrong place because a current took them further away from where they thought they were going to land. And so they had no alternative but to get out of their landing craft in the morning just to face a barrage of Turkish machine guns. So it's always been a very uh, telling and defining moment for Australians and New Zealanders. But as I say, when you go around the whole peninsula and you see all these, these terrible cemeteries, there are more than 100 of these cemeteries there. As you see them, you're, it brings to life um, the people involved. And one of the things that really struck me were the, were the graves, the individual grave markers, because um, the British had graves that were incredibly proper. They either had the name, the, the number, the military number, the rank, perhaps. They could be in a graveyard just for that regiment. But if you go around things like Lone Pine, which is the Australian cemetery, they were allowed to put in their own epitaphs. And there's one terrible one. I mean, there are many terrible ones. But the one that lives with me, that it's just said something, that doing his duty, that's all. And you still wonder whether when they went to the family in Australia and said, what would you like on your son's tomb? Whether they said, doing his duty. And the army officer said, do you want anything else? And the person said, that's all. And yet there it is, doing his duty, that's all. And there are many, many, many of these individual epitaphs that are heartbreaking. Now, Melissa Dunphy, knows probably more about this campaign than I do and, and has read up about it. And so what she did was put this all to music using a poem by a Gallipoli survivor, an Australian survivor, but also some of these epitaphs. You hear as everything sort of gets worse and worse, eventually the silence, and you hear the last post, which is that bugle call in the... Uh, armed forces at a funeral. And you can hear a solo soprano singing that. And before that, at the beginning of the piece and at the end of the piece, you hear just the ebbing and flowing of the Aegean Sea, just lapping the shoreline. And again, what's so striking is the shoreline around the Dardanelles, around Gallipoli, is actually very tranquil. It's not the wild Atlantic Ocean. It's very tranquil. And for me, somebody who's spent my life teaching Greek and Latin as well as working in music, it's even more poignant to realize that just down the coast, very short distance, is Troy. So, so many of those British soldiers, as they were going to the Dardanelles, as they were going to Gallipoli, had their copy of Homer's Iliad as one of the things they read as they went. So it's a really a conjunction of so many different themes and so many uh, ideas. And there are not many people I know out there who can do justice to that. But Melissa Dunphy is definitely one of those composers. So I hope you enjoy and appreciate, perhaps, her representation of Waves of Gallipoli by Melissa Dunphy.
So Philip, I love the last piece that you chose. Um, and it really represents the culmination of all of these relationships that have been built up over time and honors a woman who has done a lot to advance the cause of good music in St. Louis. So tell us about this piece. We are so, we've been so blessed in St. Louis to have a classical music critic who's not only intelligent and articulate, but is particularly informed about vocal and choral music because her whole training from opera in Chicago on to her professional career as a journalist has been in singing. And her name is Sarah Brian Miller. And she has, I always like to say, she has praised us when we deserve the praise and she's castigated us when we deserve to be told that we were not up to stuff. She keeps us honest. And so we've been very, very blessed to have this woman journalist um, at our side season after season. Now, I learned that uh, from Brian herself that she has been battling cancer for some years. And as her dec uh, second decade came nigh as critic in St. Louis, we decided we wanted to um, not wait any longer, but to celebrate and and to really hail her contribution. She's facing a great challenge in cancer, but she should know just how much she means to all of us here. And so this was the time to uh, have a piece written specifically for her. Um, it's very, very rare, I would suggest, that performers and performing ensembles decide to have music written for a critic. The relationship between critics and performers is sometimes a difficult one. Here, we've been very, very lucky. So anyway, we decided we wanted to write a piece of, have a piece of music written for her. Obviously, she's been such a great champion of our work, and she's been particularly appreciative of our advocacy for women composers. It had to be a woman composer. And one of the composers that she has singled out and followed with great appreciation, I would suggest, is a British composer called Judith Bingham. Now, Judith has written a lot of music for the chamber chorus over many years, and most of that music already has been recorded on our commercial CDs. So you can go and listen to those either through a CD or through uh, Spotify or one of these online services. Her music is always incredibly evocative. It's got a feeling to it, a, rather like Melissa Dunphy, actually, in that sense, conjuring up a mood. And so we asked her whether she'd be willing to write this piece of music with very little notice, it must be said. And I think it's a testimony to Judith's admiration and appreciation of Brian that she said that no matter how busy she was, she would do this piece now. So um, we asked Brian what was her sort of text she would like, what favorite text, and she said that she was particularly fond of an early translation into English of Psalm 121. I lift mine eyes up to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who has made heaven and earth. Uh, Brian is a lifelong Episcopalian and the Psalms and scripture mean a tremendous amount to her. So we gave Judith Bingham that brief and she wrote an amazing piece of music because it's a, a, a very versatile piece. It is a psalm setting for choir, but it's designed to be performable in lots of different permutations depending on what your forces are. And the reason is this was put together not just by the chamber chorus, but by a variety of choirs throughout St. Louis. It was a consortium. There were church choirs, there were college choirs, there was synagogue choir, and then there's our choir, which is not a religious choir at all. But we all came together and we wanted a piece that would work on many levels. So the piece can be formed by one choir and piano, one choir, piano and organ, two choirs, piano, two choirs, piano and organ. And it's that last full version that you're going to hear now. We're going to finish our presentation with a very, very recent work, again, by a woman composer for an outstanding woman journalist in St. Louis. This is 
Judith Bingham's Psalm 121 for Sarah Brian Miller.
We will end just with one question since we've run out of time. And I think it's actually a good question to end on, which is, Philip, was there a, a moment or an event that led you down this path towards advocacy for women composers? Was there one specific aha moment or did it develop over time? I think a bit of both, if I can hedge my bets. Um, I certainly didn't come into the chamber chorus saying, and by the way, part of my agenda is to advocate for women composers. But it was the growing realization that when we did a piece by a woman composer, it was thought of as novel and extraordinary. And I did a bit of research and found out that approximately half the population are female. And yet, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, I shouldn't even be having this discussion, really. The fact that you have to ask that question, which is legit, is ridiculous. I mean, women composers should be on any program, anywhere. There shouldn't be a concert just with women composers. We've done that this time because we wanted to draw together all of this advocacy we've, we've committed to over decades. But women can write just as much wonderful, powerful music as men if they're given the opportunity to do it and the support to do it. And if there are groups out there encouraging them and saying, whatever you have to, to, to perform, if it's of the right quality, we will, of course, consider it, just as we would anybody, any gender or identification or ethnicity. The quality of the music is the thing that really governs our choices. What's shocking, in a way, is not that we advocate for women composers, but that it's still considered to be newsworthy and unusual. The one thing I would say is that as generations change, attitudes change, you definitely now have more women on the podium conducting than you did when I first started with this group. I don't know, I think the jury is still out with women composers. When I first came to St. Louis, there was a woman composer in residence, Joan Tower, a towering figure in American music. And it's been very quiet since then, here. So it may be that in other places around the country and around the world, women composers definitely are getting more exposure and more encouragement. But we certainly recognize that we need to declare that that's one of the things this choir does. Once it becomes commonplace for uh, women to be found on concert programs just as much as men, um, then we won't talk about it anymore. But at this point, I'm afraid it is something that is worth declaring. And what I'm so grateful for is the fact that the singers and the audiences and the board members, everybody is, is supportive of this. So maybe you know we're making some progress, but it's very slow. We began this program by saying that America seems to have just elected its first female vice president. Maybe things are changing. We just have to hope so. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for um, listening to these stories and supporting us in this unusual time. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you in December That's right. with a third presentation. So thank you.